My name is Juan Carlos Sanchez and I am a former conman. I was born in Venezuela originally and uh, I was raised there until I was about 13 years old that I came to the United States. At that time I came to finish my edu education. I went to uh, Lake Worth High School, finished my high school there and then decided to go to school in St. Cloud, Minnesota. I figure I wanted to have an experience, what I will call back then an all-white experience. So I had to go to a town in the Midwest where I could really, really immerse myself in the culture that I was living in. Obviously, because of financial situations, I couldn't finish college. I got a job at Walmart. I was working in the foods and stationery department at that time. And it just was not sustainable. I couldn't support myself. It was just... It was just a bad time. So I decided to move from Minnesota back to Florida. But at that time I had to choose a place where I knew things were happening. So I figured Disney's in Orlando. I must go to Orlando. If Mickey's there, something's going on there. So I came back to Orlando, Florida. And uh, I was working at the time at a resort called a Marriott Vacation Club. I got a job as a uh, golf cart driver. So what I would do is, I didn't know, I was driving salespeople to a sales presentation of a timeshare resort. And I memorized the presentation. So what would happen is the new salespeople will come in, they didn't know the property, so I will start pitching people as the golf cart driver. And one of the salespeople told me, listen, you are really good at what you do. Somehow when you are talking, these people are listening to you and you're not even a salesperson. You gotta get your real estate license and start selling timeshare. I was 19 or 18 at the time, maybe 19. And I went ahead and I got my Florida real estate license. And I started working selling timeshare. At that time, I was working for a company called Westgate Resorts, Central Florida Investments. And at the age of 20, I became the person with the highest sales volume in the world. I found myself making more money than I ever dreamed of. And I knew that I had this gift. I had a gift of the gap. I knew that I could sit down and in 90 minutes or less, convince anybody to invest twenty, thirty thousand dollars $30,000 in a product that didn't work in exchange for some Disney tickets. At that time, I got uh, recruited by another company, I went there and I became their head of uh, training and development. And I developed what is considered until today, 28 years later, the most cutting edge sales training program in the timeshare industry. Unfortunately, because of immaturity and, and, and ego, and I, I decided to breach my contract. And it was a three year contract I breached it on the second year and I was sued for breachment of contract, civil conspiracy, damages of $2.3 million, and uh, they enforced what's called a non-compete. So for the next two years, I couldn't work. And I found myself sitting at home with a newborn baby and a nine-year-old daughter that, I had, that had come into my life. I was married. And uh, I started losing everything. I started losing, losing the cars. I started losing the houses. I had no money in the bank account. I couldn't afford to buy diapers. And uh, I remember my wife telling me, listen, you got us into this. You need to figure out how to get yourself out of this because we need money. So I decided, man, I think the secret here is to find a market that nobody's tapping into and offering them a product that doesn't exist yet. So I found the Hispanic market, which is my market, obviously. And uh, I created what became the first real estate company in Florida that offered real estate licensing in Spanish. We were the only school in the state of Florida that taught the course to get your license in Spanish, even when the exam was in English. And uh, I became a legend because my students were coming from all over the state 
and they were passing the real estate exam in English, even if they didn't speak the language. I cannot develop a science of how to take the exam and pass it the first time. So as the school grew, I became very well known in the industry. And I realized I'm having these classrooms full of people, 60, 70, 80, 100 at a time. And they all want to sell real estate. We're not talking 2001. They all want to sell real estate. I have a captive audience. This is what I need. What I need to do is I need to open offices, brokerages, recruit my own students, and teach them everything I know about high pressure sales. So I kind of timesharized the industry. I developed sales centers in which families will come in and I developed a sales crew that back in those days I used to call my mercenaries. And it just became a machine. It became a machine and, uh, and I was very young. I was extremely arrogant. I had a lot of money. I was making, I think on, on my slowest year, probably about 27, 28 million dollars. And uh, developers started looking for me. And uh, they started giving me product that didn't work. Basically what they did is they said, listen, we have this project. It has a lot of flaws. It will not appraise. And we need to get, get it off our hands. You need to sell it for us. We hear you're a machine and you need to sell it for us. So basically at that time what I did is I will go into the projects, I will manipulate the values by doing fake closings inside of the project. Therefore, I will increase the value of the property falsely. And then I will host these huge seminars of how to invest in real estate. And what I would do is I would get up there and I had music and I had a beautiful women walking around wearing suits and I will go and I start talking, talking about investing, talking about finances. I will talk about how much money I made in real estate. I will show them my lifestyle. I remember I will walk in on tailor-made suits that cost thousands of dollars, okay? I had the expensive watch, but I had the, I had the gap. I could talk to people and I, was, uh, I, I will sell my story. You know, I came from nothing and now I have millions of dollars because of real estate. So I'm gonna teach you how to do it. And then from that group, when it was sizzling, when it was hot, when I knew I had them, I will throw my mercenaries out. And these mercenaries were a group of spectacular looking women that were extremely sales aggressive. And they will sit with these families and literally take their money right there on those events. And uh, we will sell out 100 apartments in a day, 80 apartments in a day. I mean, I remember we used to rent buses and fill up these buses, go to these developments, I will get everybody down, get them to sign contracts, get them back in the bus and take them back to the conference room. It was insane. So what began to happen is Interest rates started going up. The economy was beginning to get hyperinflated. And developers kept asking me not only to sell out, but to sell out faster. So in order for me to do that, I had to create incentives and I had to become creative in the way these things will get financed. So sometimes one client, we will sell them five apartments six apartments, the same client, okay? I was, I, was I was dealing with mortgage brokers, I was dealing with uh, lenders, and they were all in the deal. Countrywide, IndyMac, Long Beach, uh, First Franklin Bank, these were all little lenders that had hundreds of millions of dollars. And they were throwing it at me, asking me to move it. So what I would do is I would get the same client alone with each bank at the same time. All were primary residents or 0% down. These clients didn't have the money to afford one apartment, definitely not five, 
but they had a promise that we were gonna rent it for them and they were buying it. They were buying it because greed was on the streets and greed was the word. And I was having these seminars where I was showing people how to be like me and how to look like me and how to dress like me and how to travel like me. I mean, I remember at one point I went to Fiji to uh, uh, Sabu Sabu, one of the smaller islands, for a spiritual retreat for two weeks just so I can spend two weeks with our guru from India so he could teach me how to relax. And at that time, uh, in the same yoga session, I was with Pat Riley, I was with Marilyn Hemingway, I was with uh, Mark Burnett. I mean, this, these were the people that I was sitting there and meditating with. And, and it was just, a, it was just a, a surreal lifestyle, okay? Uh, I remember one of my uh, favorite trips, we went to Monte Carlo to meet Dr. Alan Wolf, who's one of the creators of that movie called The Secret. And uh, we did a 10 day immersion with him so we could learn how to manifest. And people wanted to hear those stories and they wanted to hear how I was traveling around the world and how I knew all these people and spent time with these people. And, and I told them that in order to get the lifestyle that I had, they had to start investing with me. I knew how to make money, so if I took their money, they would make as much money as I was making. And the bottom line is this, the only guy that was making money on that deal was me, okay? So this disaster begins to happen, and out of the sudden, one day I wake up, and I see the news, and the lenders, Fannie Mae specifically, decided to stop buying loans on the secondary market. What that means is banks that were lending no longer had somebody to give them that money back so they could lend again. So loans began to stop, which means I had all this apartment complex. At that time, I probably had, I wanna say about seven buildings that I was specifically selling. I'm talking about each building had about 300 apartments. And I had a sales crew and management crew of about 125 people. And uh, that operation was costing me about 250 to $300,000 a week. So just on payroll, I was spending about $300,000 a week. And it was okay because I was closing faster than I could pay. But the moment that came to a halt, I had to keep my salespeople there. And uh, at that time, I'm sitting there losing $300,000 a week. I have all these properties that are not closing. I have all these clients that are expecting to have five apartments, and now they don't want to do it anymore because they're hearing all these horror stories about the economy. They're asking for their escrow back. I cannot give them their escrow because I have their money tight and, and these lenders are lending me money against that escrow for me to cover my payroll. And I say, oh my God, oh my God, I'm gonna collapse. This monster is alive and this monster is hungry and it's asking me for money. So I sit there and I go, well, I can no longer take money from these people because I'm not closing, I need, to find a source, I need to find a source of funding. I need somebody to give me an injection of money. And at that time, I meet a former judge from Venezuela. This is a person that was super connected with the Venezuelan government, specifically with the Chavez government. And he tells me, listen, if you need money, I have the investors for you. This is what you need to do. You need to go to Venezuela and you need to talk to these people. So I fly to Venezuela and I do a presentation on the revenue that my company has had for the last couple of years. And I tell them, listen, it's a great opportunity for you guys to invest. All you gotta do is invest in my company. The moment the banks start lending again, you will get your money back and then you will get a chunk of my profit. Sure enough, after that presentation, I convinced them. And these government officials 
give me millions of dollars. I come to the United States with that money and I invested in my company. This company, by the way, by this point, is sucking $300,000 a week. So a couple millions, they're not gonna last me any more than a couple months. And sure enough, a few months go by and I lose their money. So now I'm in debt with the Venezuelan government, with officials from the Venezuelan government. And I don't know where this money is coming from. I'm thinking it's their own money. What I didn't know that I found out later was that this money was coming from a cartel, a Colombian cartel. So they call me, they tell me that they want a statement where their money's at, they want to know where their money's at. And I tell them that uh, unfortunately the money's gone. So now I'm forced to go to Venezuela and face these people. At this time, I am freaking out. So I say, I was dating a girl, her name is Michelle. And I told Michelle, eh, listen, I have to go to Venezuela. And uh, this is how it's going to work. You are going to be there for me, please, if you don't mind. I need you to wait for my call when I land. I'm going to land at this time. If by that time I haven't called you, it, they probably kidnap me or they probably kill me. She said, man, I can't deal with you anymore. This is just too stressful. I cannot deal with you. I need to, this relationship. So I said, listen, listen, you can break up with me, but please do it when I come back. I need somebody here that is reliable. At that time, I was divorced. At that time, uh, I, it, my life was a complete disaster. I was sleeping three, four hours a day. I had employees asking me for their paychecks. I, had, I was overextended on all my credit cards. And I just needed, needed, needed to go there and try to see if I could convince these people to give me more money. So I go there, I land, the doors of the plane open up. I text Michelle, I tell her, listen, I just landed. And I hear that the flight attendant calls my name. And when I look up, there is two officials, two military officials coming into the plane and they're there to escort me out. So they escort me out of the plane. We go past customs because we didn't even do customs. And uh, they decide to lock me in a hotel room and basically keep me there disconnected from the world until I tell them where the money's at and when are they gonna get it back. So I keep telling them, listen, I cannot give you what you want from Venezuela. I have to go back to the United States and I have to talk to the banks where I have your money. Your money's there, your money's safe. But I have to talk to the banks where I have your money so they can give me a statement. And they kept telling me, no, you need to tell us right now where the money is. We need to know where the money is right now. Man, I just, there was nothing I could tell them to convince them that I couldn't do that from Venezuela. I knew the money was gone, but obviously they didn't know it was gone. So they suspected it, but they didn't know. So one day goes by, I'm locked into a room. I have all these guards that are guarding me so I don't escape. The second day goes by. I tell them, listen, I don't need my laptop, but I need access to an email because uh, I need to email the bank. If you want to know where your money's at, I need to email the bank. So they give me a laptop and I send an email to Michelle. And I say, listen, Michelle, I need you to do me a favor. I need you to get me an airplane ticket from Venezuela to anywhere in the United States for tomorrow morning, okay? I kept hearing these guards that they were going to have a party, that they were gonna hire some prostitutes, there were some drugs coming in, there was some alcohol coming in. I said, this is it, this is what I need to do. I need to make sure these guys party their asses off so I can escape. So I sent her the email, tell her, buy this ticket, at this time, 
I need to make sure I'm on a plane from American Airlines anywhere in the United States. I disconnect the laptop, I close my email, and I just sit there and wait. These guys keep coming back and forth. Where is the money? Where is the money? Have you talked to the banks? Have you talked to the banks? I kept telling them, man, I'm trying. But they need to see me in person. If they don't see me, they're not going to tell me over the phone. Anybody can call and ask where this guy's money is at. You need to go there in person, especially that kind of cash. We're not talking about $150. This is not an ATM receipt, you know? And uh, but, I, but my pitch was, listen, but you're missing the point. The point is this. You need to, instead of asking where your money's at, because your money's safe, what you need to do is you need to give me more money because it, you're going to miss out on a great opportunity. These banks are ready to open up again, and these banks are ready to start closing again, and you're going to regret not being fully invested on it. So they kept asking me where the money was at, where the money was at. Sure enough, they have this huge party. All these guards are getting wasted. There is about, I don't know, two or three prostitutes per guard. All kind of drugs show up. And uh, I'm just sitting there watching, you know. I'm watching this guy get wasted. I'm, got, I'm watching these guys having sex with two or three girls, going to the bathrooms, going to other rooms, going to the patio. And I'm sitting there going, these guys are going to collapse sooner or later. And that's my cue. So it's probably, uh, probably about... I want to say 1.30 a.m., 2 a.m., the party starts simmering down. And I say, okay, this is my cue. I see the guards are passing out. I see the prostitutes are next to them. I go open one of the drawers. I grab my passport. I grab some money that I had there. I close the drawer. And I'm kind of like sneaking out. And then I turn around. And I see that there is a prostitute laying down and her eyes are open. And I said, and she just winked at me. And I walked out, got on the first cab I could, went to the airport, went to the American Airlines counter. I said, I have a reservation. The lady looked it up. She said, yes, you have a one-way ticket, Caracas, Miami. First class is already paid for. At that time, one way, because of last minute, I think she paid like $1,900. I later found out that my brother was the one that actually paid for the ticket. And uh, I got on the plane, and I got to the United States. The moment I landed, I got a brand new cell phone with the same number. I just got it transferred. And sure enough, my phone is blown up. And it's all these people from Venezuela. Listen. We're going to kill you. We know that you lost your money. We're going to kill all your family. We're going to chop you into pieces, etc., etc., etc. And I begin to get actual threats on video sent to my email. At one point, they say, this is what's going to happen to you. So they send me a video of one guy, and they put him in the middle. This is in a prison, by the way. And they paid all the other inmates to take turns raping him. And after they were done, they chopped him into pieces while somebody's recording this and sending it to me with a message saying, if you don't give us your our money, this is what's going to happen to you. Then about two weeks after that, they sent me another video of uh, a guy in a motorcycle just driving by, he gets into a barber shop, picks a guy, shoots him in the head, walks out, and goes, this is what's gonna happen to you if you don't give us our money. So I begin to freak out, I'm like, okay, obviously these guys mean business, so I cannot go back to Venezuela, but I have this operation bleeding here, so I need more money. So I called him, and I said, listen, this is the deal. Your money is frozen right now because I need to start closing on apartments. And until I start closing, you're not going to get your money back and I'm not going to get my money back. So this, if you want your money back, this is what I need you to do. I need you to wire me a couple million dollars to this account specifically. And then I'm going to disburse that money to this lender. He's going to see 
that there is money coming in and he's gonna release the funds and he's gonna allow us to close. Sure enough, I send them evidence of these things, I'll falsify, so I'll falsify some bank letters and I send them to them. I send all kind of requirements that they ask for and I get my wire. And before you know it, I take their money for a second time and I lose it. At that time, things went out of control. I was getting death threats every day. I was getting, te I was getting text messages every day. It was just bad. One day I walk into my office and the secretaries tell me, listen, two federal agents came in and they just took all of our computers. I said, okay, I don't mind. I don't mind if they take all the computers because I already knew that some things were not clean. So I always had external hard drives and uh, I made sure they saved everything there and disconnected it before they went home. So I said, that's fine. They're not going to find anything in the computers. They took the computers with them. About a month later, I get what's called a target letter, which is I get a letter stating that I'm a target of a federal investigation and that they would like to talk to me. And I, they give me an appointment at the federal court building in Las Olas Boulevard in Fort Lauderdale. I freak out. I've never been investigated in a criminal case. I mean, I have been to civil court and some I've lost, some I've won, but I'm, I was still free. But I knew this meant prison time. So I hired an attorney to go down there with me and I meet a federal prosecutor and two federal agents. And they tell me, listen, we have all this with your name in it. Apparently your name is everywhere in South Florida, but you've been under the radar for a long time. We need you to tell us what you know about this and if there is anybody else involved. I said, let me have a minute here with my attorney. Of course, this guy was not a criminal defense attorney. He was a corporate attorney. So I tell him, listen, do these guys know what they're talking about? And my attorney goes, if they knew you were getting, you would be getting arrested right now. Obviously, they don't know. I called them back in. I said, listen, I don't know what you're talking about. And I remember my prosecutor looked at me and said, you know what? We gave you a chance. You're going to remember this day one day. And he walked away and I looked at my attorney and my attorney looked at me and he said, we got him. And I said, all right, we got him. They have nothing on me. I walked out of there and I said, eh, I got to get out of Florida. I got to get out of Florida because these guys are after me. I need to find a place to hide. So I decide to move to New York because I figure I have two kids. I'm not going to separate myself from my kids. I want to make sure I'm in connection with my kids at all time. So I need to go to a place where I can hide on plain sight. I need to go to a place where although I'm hidden, you cannot find me. You know, even, and I, but, you are, but I'm exposed, you know. I'm on the streets, but I'm on the streets with millions of people. So I moved to New York, and New York is one of those few places where people don't care about your credit or your name or who you are or who you were. They're too busy. So I get an apartment, and uh, I don't use my name. I don't use my credit. I have a P.O. box where I mail everything. Nobody knows where I live. Uh, the way it will work is... I will come and visit my kids, but I never told them when I was showing up. So I will randomly show up, pick them up from school, spend a couple days, drop them off, then take off again to New York. And then I will tell them to come and visit me in New York, but we never stayed in my house. We will stay in different hotels in the city. That way, nobody knew where I lived. And, uh, and I lived like that for a few years. But I needed to make money. So... One day I'm walking around Soho and I see all these art galleries and I go, man, I wonder if there is money on art. So I come into a gallery and there's nobody there. And I tell the sales lady, listen, I mean, are you guys selling? 
And she goes, yeah, you know, we get the occasional, you know, passer and we call them over and yeah, we'll sell a piece here, a piece there. I said, listen, do you think the owner of the gallery will allow me to do an event here and promote his gallery? She said, I don't see why not. I said, perfect, put me in contact with him. And I have the meeting and he agrees to allow me to do an event, a private event in their gallery for a night. And sure enough, I do the same thing I did in real estate. I trained the salespeople for that night. I told them, you're gonna let me talk. I'm gonna talk about art. And when these people are ready to buy, I'm gonna let them loose. You're gonna get them. You're gonna take their money. All right? They said, all right. And I hosted my first event in one of the galleries at Soho. And it was a success, a success. I had them drooling. I kept telling them about how a complete investment portfolio should always have art. Everybody has real estate, gold, and art. And I knew for a fact that they may have real estate, they may have gold, but nobody has art. And art is the only form that wouldn't depreciate in value. And I brought all these statistics and I talked about the Mona Lisa and Monet and Picasso and you name it, okay? And sure enough, 45 minutes into my presentation, they kept asking me, but what do I buy? Where, wh what kind of art would I buy? What's the best kind of art? And I will say, man, I got these guys. And then we will play games, which I remember we played a game once called a uh, credit card poker. Because these guys didn't come with like $20,000 in their pocket. <clears throat> but I knew they had credit cards in their wallets. So I told the salespeople, I said, listen, we're gonna play a game called credit card poker. So I need you to, play, to pay close attention to the people that are sitting here. And I will get up and I will say, okay, we're gonna give you guys an autographed picture of one of the artists here. Not a painting, but an actual picture of the artist autographed to you. But uh, it's only gonna go to one winner. And we're gonna play what's called credit card poker. So whoever has the most combined zeros on their credit cards combined is gonna win this picture, okay? So at the count of three, I need you all to take your credit cards out, count all the zeros and add them up, and whoever has the most verifiable zeros will win. Ready? One, two, three, go. And everybody will take their wallets out, take their credit cards out, and then I had a runner. I had somebody walking around saying, okay, table 16, that he has a Black American Express, Visa MasterCard. This guy has four credit cards. This guy only has one premier bank credit card, which is a secure credit card. We don't want to talk to him. Blah, blah, blah. So they will pre-screen the room to see who had credit cards that night and who didn't. Once they knew that, I will build them up. They will go out and they will sell art. And sure enough, in no time, I was making money again. This time I'm in New York. I'm living the life. I'm single. Nobody knows my past. Nobody knows that I'm a con artist. Nobody knows that the feds are after me. And I start dating. And I start dating this girl named Cassandra. Years go by. Everything is fine in New York. My kids are coming to visit me. We're staying in hotels. We're seeing Broadway plays. I come to Florida. I pick them up. We hang out. And one day, I get a phone call from my ex-wife. And uh, she says, listen, the kids will not be able to go to New York again unless you give me your address because I need to know where you live. I need to know that they're safe. And as I'm listening to the phone call, I'm thinking I'm being set up. So I tell her, I said, uh, are you sure you want my address used for the kids? And she said, no, maybe I wanna send you flowers one day. And I said, oh yeah, this is a setup. So I gave her my address because I had to see my kids. And I knew it was a matter of time before I got arrested. I was at the time dating Cassandra. <clears throat> we have had, this is April 30th of 2012 now. We had an argument 
on a Sunday. On a Monday, I decided not to go to work. And uh, I called Cassandra and I said, listen, can you come to my apartment and I'll order some food and I will hang out and, you know, I will make up and I'm sorry, I was such a jerk and whatever, whatever. She, sure enough, she shows up. I let her in. We're sitting on the couch. We're waiting for sushi. And I hear the door. Talk, talk, talk. I open the door. It's the driver. He gives me the sushi. I pay him. He closes the door. And out of the sudden I hear, boom, 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 boom. And I say, oh my God, this guy is crazy. I look at the bill. I look at Cassandra and I say, I gave him a huge tip. Then I hear, boom, boom, boom. I said, okay, I'm gonna tell this guy a thing or two. I open the door and all I feel is two hands that grab me on the chest and pull me out. I look up the stairs and I have a bunch of people pointing down at me. I look down the stairs and I have a bunch of people pointing up at me. I look at the front, there's NYPD with a picture of me and the guy goes, Juan Carlos Sanchez. And I say, yeah. He says, you're under arrest, you're being extradited to the state of Florida. And the agent that had interviewed me in 2008 came around the back, looked at me and said, you thought I wasn't gonna find you, right? And I looked at him and I said, I knew you would. I knew it was a matter of time. And he looked at me and he said, you are never gonna see the streets again. And that's when my world fell apart and I knew it was real. So we came into the apartment and I remember now, of course, Cassandra doesn't know who I am. She doesn't know any of this. Her eyes are like this. I have all these officers coming in and I tell them, listen, she doesn't know any of this. She has nothing to do with this. She needs to get out. The officers tell her, yeah, you're free to go. So as she's walking out, she turns around. I tell her, I need you to call my brother and tell him that I'm getting arrested. And she looks at the officers and she looks at all these guns and all these things and she tells him, listen, he hasn't eaten any lunch. Can you make sure he eats before he goes? And I'm sitting there going, that is the cutest thing I've ever heard, but she really thinks I'm hungry at this time? I mean, my stomach was not. So she leaves. The New York officer was actually a gentleman. And uh, he looked at me and he said, uh, any drugs in the apartment? I said, no. He said, any guns in the apartment? I said, no. He said, are you going to behave? I said, yeah. He said, okay, I'm going to get you some shoes that don't have any laces. And I'm going to get you a sweatshirt. I'm going to handcuff you in the front. I'm going to put the sweatshirt over and you're gonna walk out with us because nobody needs to have a show today. And I'm sitting there going, nobody needs to have a show? You have people on the stairs, up and down the stairs. So they do all this, they read me my Miranda, <clears throat> and they walk me out. As I'm walked out and I'm handcuffed like this and I'm walking to the police car, I look to each side of the, ha of the, of the street. There's cars here, cars here blocking the street and I look at the guy and I go no shows huh and he goes uh, well nobody knows it's you so they put me in the back of the car my agent that investigated me sits there with me and they drive me to the Brooklyn detention center and he's sitting back there telling me you're never gonna see the light we're gonna give you 30 years you should have testified when you had a chance everybody talked about you and I'm thinking, how did they know where I lived? And uh, he looks at me and he goes, oh, and by the way, your kids are going on a summer vacation and you probably won't be out. So your ex-wife asked us to have you sign a permission to travel. And I looked at him and he looked at me and he said, yeah, you know. And I said, okay, I was right. She was setting me up. So I get to Brooklyn. 
I got booked there. I go to my first hearing there. I don't know what's going on. I mean, I, I, I get a public defender and they take me to a magistrate hearing and it's my bond hearing and, and it's just a blur. But I, all I remember is me getting a $5,000 signature bond. That means that anybody with five grand could bail me out. So I call a friend of mine and I said, you need to come here and get me out. She shows up with $5,000, sets bond, and uh, hours go by, hours go by, hours go by, I'm not getting out. Sure enough, my prosecutor from Florida filed an emergency motion saying, do not bond him out. This guy has accounts all over the world. He has he, he's lived in China for a minute. He has been all over Europe. This guy has money stashed somewhere and he's gonna get out and he's gonna get on a plane and he's gonna leave and we're never gonna find him again. He needs to come to Florida. <coughs> so they get me on a plane and they start parading me around, what's called diesel therapy. So they move me from Brooklyn to Oklahoma, Oklahoma, Atlanta, Atlanta, Tallahassee, Tallahassee, Miami, Miami, Fort Lauderdale. And uh, my charges are read there again. Obviously, I'm not, I don't have a bond. They deny bond because of a flight risk. And they start asking 30 years. At that point, uh, my uh, family decides to hire an attorney. But for some unknown reason, they hire a Spanish-speaking attorney who speaks very little English. Now, mind you, we're on federal court here in front of an American judge, and it's the United States versus Juan Carlos Sanchez. So the first time this guy comes to see me, <clears throat> I hear him talking, and he's like, well, you know, uh, you're not going to do more than five years. And I said, oh, my God. I said, I have Ricky Ricardo as my attorney. This is not good. I start telling him, listen, what do they want to know? What do they need to know? I'm ready to help. I'm ready to cooperate now. He goes, no, the government doesn't want to talk to you. They gave you a chance and you didn't talk. Everybody already talked and they all pointed the finger at you. And guess what? They're asking for 30 years and I don't think they're going to go any number of days below that. We keep fighting and fighting and fighting. And finally, one day he comes to me and he says, listen, this is the lowest you're going to go. 18 years. Take it or leave it. I looked at it. I looked at him and I said, I'm going to sign my life away for you. I started crying and I remember saying, man, I'm not going to see my kids for 18 years. And he said, no, don't worry. Don't worry. We will do something. I signed. I gave it to him. I said, well, you better do something. Finally, I go to my sentencing. When I walked in, I remember looking around and I see the courtroom is full of people, full of friends. And my ex-wife is there, my ex-sister-in-law is there. And sure enough, the prosecutor gets up. He says, we want to give this guy 18 years. He's a fraudster, he's a con artist, he scammed the Spanish community out of money, he took advantage of their lack of knowledge, and etc. etc. I look at my attorney, I figure this guy's gonna get up and he's gonna blow the roof of the house. He gets up, he says, uh, My client here is a good man, he's a good person, he's a good father, he's a good son, 18 years is too much. And he sat down. And I said, What? That's the difference we have? So the judge looked at me and said, do you want to talk? I said, yeah. And I got up. And the tears just came. And I just couldn't talk. I just couldn't talk because I knew my kids at the time were 12 and 21. And according to what I had just signed, the next time I saw my kids, they were going to be 30 years old, my youngest one. Okay, and uh, man, I just couldn't, I just, it was just too much. So I said, Your Honor, listen, I did it, I committed a crime. And uh, 
there is not a right way to do the wrong thing and I should be penalized and I should be punished. I have two kids that need to learn the value of justice and right and wrong. And if I'm going to be an example, I need to be that example. I just think 18 years may destroy my family, may destroy my children, you know. And I started talking and just sobbing and sobbing and sobbing. And he looked at me and he said, you're a smart young man. Why did you do it? I said, because smart people are not immune from doing stupid things. And he looked at me and he said, I like that answer. He said, I can give you more than 18 years, by the way, but I can also give you less than 18 years. And I said, you know what? I'm going to give you 15 years, 118 mo 180 months. And I walked out of there. And as I'm walking out, my attorney looks at me and he goes, we came out okay. And I said, we came out okay? You're going to do half my time? He said, uh, I, well, I know you're upset, but we'll talk later. He never visited me again. He never talked to me again. But years later, I found out that when, when he got out, he told all my friends that were there, we must consider this a success today because he was going to get 30 years and technically we got half. So apparently, he didn't only screw me and got me 15 years. I was supposed to be happy about it. So I get transferred back to Broward County Prison, which is where I was staying at. And then they moved me back to Miami Federal Detention Center. And uh, I, I talked to some people and I'm like, listen, I just got 15 years. And everybody's like, oh my God, that's insane. And I said, yes, I know, it's kind of crazy. They said, well, man, I mean, you gotta do what you gotta do. You gotta do your time. But there's one friend of mine, Keith, and he kept saying, bro, that's too much. You should talk to my attorney. And I said, well, what's your attorney's name? And he said, my attorney's name is Paul Petruzzi. The best attorney you will find out there, he will fix your sentence. I said, man, you got to give me his number. You got to give me his number. He's like, yeah, 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 yeah. Well, one day, Keith is gone. I don't get Paul Petruzzi's number. And then another guy comes into the floor. His name is Angel. And Angel is like, oh my God, I'm here because I just got resentenced. They just lowered my sentence and I'm going home now. And I said, who was your attorney? He said, my attorney is Paul Petrucci. I said, dude, you got to give me this guy's number. He said, yeah, 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 yeah. Well, they locked us down. And apparently, it was a fight. We were locked down for a while. I'm sitting there going, well, this guy is going to leave in a couple days. I'm not going to have a chance to get to know this attorney guy. When you're locked down in prison, they will drive the little book cart around and you can pick a book. So basically what I did is the guy is coming around with a book card and I tell him, listen, I want that book over there. And it was chicken soup for the prisoner's soul. I grab the book, I open it, I start reading it, and out of a sudden a business card falls. And I look at it and it's Paul Petruzzi, PA attorney at law. And I said, man, this is a sign. This is it. This is the guy that is going to get me out. They open the floor. I send him an email because we have a system where you can email attorneys. And I said, listen, my name is Juan Carlos Sanchez. This is my case. You come highly recommended. This is my situation. I want to talk to you. A couple of days later, I'm on the floor and I get this Juan Sanchez attorney's visit. They bring me down to the visitation room and there is this attorney, short guy, kind of odd looking, long hair, beard, super casual. He sits down, I say, man, people speak very highly of you. He goes, well, listen, let me tell you what's going on. I called your prosecutor. I said, already? He goes, yeah, because I'm not going to waste any time. He hates you. He hates you with passion. As a matter of fact, he says that if he could have given you 30, he would give you 30. I said, well, that's not good news. He goes, no. It's really bad news. So really there is nothing I can do for you. I said, wow, that's it, eh? I gotta do 15. He goes, yeah. He said, but I'm already here. You are already here. Let's talk. Let me get to know you. Maybe, maybe by fishing I can get something. He goes, what, your case is fraud. And I said, yeah. He goes, man, but it's a very sexy, I remember his, his words were, it's a very sexy case. 
because there's money from everywhere. I said, yeah, there's money from everywhere. And he goes, and you're Venezuelan, right? And I said, yeah. He goes, tell me about Venezuela. I said, man, I didn't grow up there. I grew up here. So I don't really know a lot of people there. He goes, okay, but have you ever done business in Venezuela? I said, yeah. I mean, I remember this one time that I went there and I got some money from the government and I got kidnapped and they threatened me. But I think, he goes, wait a second. What? I said, yeah, 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 but it has nothing to do with my case. My case is fraud. He goes, did you tell this to anybody? And I said, no, because my first attorney told me that the last thing I needed was to look like somebody that was laundering money. He goes, you didn't mention this to anybody. I said, no. He said, who did you meet with in Venezuela? And I said the name. And the guy goes, you know this person? And I said, absolutely. Not only do I know him, I have access to the bank accounts, corporate records, passport, everything. He said, dude, that's the most wanted guy right now in the secret service list. I said, what? He goes, that's your ticket out. You're going home. That's it. He said, this is what I need you to do. I need you to write your story, give it to me, and then I'll see who wants to talk to you about it. I'll sell your story to a prosecutor. It cannot be yours because yours hates you, but maybe somebody else. I said, all right, yeah, no problem, that's fine. I said, uh, before we go any further, how much is this gonna cost me? He said, it's gonna cost you $45,000. I said, well, man, we may have a problem there. I said, uh, the feds took everything. I don't have any money. Whatever I had left was used to pay my first attorney. And uh, man, I mean, the only thing I can tell you is when I get out, I'm gonna work super hard to pay you, I promise. And I remember he went like this to me and he said, don't worry about it, bro. I'll see you in 15 years. And I said, whoa, whoa, listen, whoa. Not like that. Give me some time. He said, I'm gonna give you 24 hours to figure it out. I'll come back tomorrow. I go up and I talk to my friend Keith. I know, sorry, I talk to my, yeah, I talk to my friend Keith, he's now out. I call him on the phone, I said, listen bro, your attorney came in, Paul Petrucci, phenomenal guy, great guy. 45,000, man, I don't have it. He said, this is what you gotta do. You gotta pray. I said, pray for 45,000? I mean, what is he gonna do? What, what's God gonna do? Sh show up with money? He said, maybe. You don't know, but you gotta pray, man. That, you do you have any other alternative? I said, no. He goes, okay, so you gotta pray. I said, all right. So that night, I start praying, I start praying. I said, man, listen, I need this money. I need it to get out. This is not for my lavish lifestyle. I just need this money to get out. I go to sleep, I wake up, and I go, I got it. We have that same system that we use to email attorneys, we can use to email our families. It's called True Links. So I email my ex-sister-in-law, and I tell her, listen, I need you to do me a huge favor. This is my username and my password for my Facebook account. I need you to take all these people out, and I need you to leave my core, maybe 300 friends, 200, 300 friends. Those are my core friends. Those are the ones that I think are gonna stick by me they're gonna be by my side through this whole ordeal. Take all my family out, by the way. She goes, oh, okay, so she does it. So then I tell her, listen, I need you to post this on my Facebook account. And it's a post that I have, which is in January of 2013. And it says, dear friends and family, I know you haven't heard from me in a while. The reason why is because I'm serving a 15 year sentence on a federal crime. This is the case number, and uh, in case people think this is a lie. And I'm looking at not seeing my kids for the next 15 years. Now I have a chance where my case can be amended, but it's costing me $45,000 to do it and I don't have any money. I have lost everything through this process. I lost friends, I lost family, I lost money. But I was holding on to one thing, and today I'm giving it up, which is my dignity. I need help. 
I need money. I need to pay this attorney. If you cannot help me financially, I understand. Please help me with your prayers. But this is my only way home. We're talking about 2012 here. 13. There's no Instagram. There's no TikTok. Well, apparently my sister-in-law posted this and this thing went viral. Viral. I had all my friends doing garage sales, bake sales, going door to door asking people for money, going to every office that I ever worked for asking people for money. I mean, they. I remember my attorney coming to see me telling me, dude, I'm getting checks for 15, 20, 25 dollars. You got to tell people to stop doing that. And I kept asking me this, and you wanted money? I'm giving you money, okay? And sure enough, I raised $45,000 through Facebook. This was through the love that my friends had for me. I mean, it was, I remember I, was, I would get updates, <clears throat> and my attorney would tell me, like, listen, they have paid 15000 they have paid 18000 And I was like, my God, this is unbelievable. When I got out, and I looked at my Facebook account, and I went back to that day, I saw everything that was being posted. All the garage sales that were being announced, all the uh, bake sales, all the drives. I mean, this was, even my daughter set up a GoFundMe before I got out of prison. It was unbelievable. Truly, 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 truly unbelievable. And sure enough, we pay our attorney, and uh, I go off to prison. You know, my attorney's job is to sell my story. And I get designated to Coleman Law. I'm sitting there in Coleman. I'm doing 15 years for a $39 million case. And uh, I'm getting to meet all these criminals, so some with less time, some with more time. And one day they call me. They say, listen, <clears throat> you need to go to the lieutenant's office. I'm thinking, man, I screwed up. I must have done something. I talked to one of my friends and I said, listen, they're calling me to the lieutenant's office. And they, he goes, oh no, the feds are coming to see you. And I said, how do you know? He goes, if you would have screwed up, they would have announced to you that you had to go to the lieutenant's office. They would have come and gunned you. They're telling you to go on your own. Believe me, the feds are there looking for you. I get there, sure enough, there is five agents never seen him before. They introduce themselves. You know, I'm from DEA, this guy's from FBI, this guy's from NSA, this guy's from HSI, this guy's from the IRS. I walk in and I say, my name is Juan Carlos Sanchez, I'm from the BOP. They all busted out laughing. They said, oh my God, this guy has a sense of humor. <coughs> I sit there, boom, they put on the table names, accounts, you know this guy, do you know this guy? Do you know this guy? These are all Venezuelan officials. I said, yeah, I know who this person is. I know who this person is. I know this bank account. I know this corporation. I know that corporation. They said, uh, okay, you need to go back down to Miami because we need to talk to you. We're only here because your attorney talked to us and we wanted to make sure you were for real. So we're bringing you down to Miami. I get transferred back to Miami to the building, and now out of the sudden, I'm getting interviewed every day by different agencies, every day. Do you know this person? Do you know this person? Do you know this money? Where is this money at? I found out that all the money that I received from the Venezuelan government was money that was being laundered, drug proceeds from the Cali cartel in Colombia. And I'm like, yeah, I know this person, I know this person. And I tell them about being kidnapped. And I tell them about the video. And, and these guys go, where's the video? At? And I said, it's on my email. So they said, well, we need you to go into your email or give us your password. So I give them the password and they look at the email. And then the following week they come and I said, did you guys look at the, at the video? And, my, and the prosecutor goes, no. And then one of the agents goes, no, I didn't look at that. And then the other guy goes, oh, I got stuck looking at it. And I said, well, I haven't looked at it completely. He said, thank God. He said, it's horrible what they do to that guy. I mean, I had to watch it from beginning to end. And I think I've never seen anything like that in my life. 
I've never seen the video completely, so I don't know what is there. But uh, I'm sure it's not nice. So they start asking me all these questions, and they say, well, we want this guy. Can you get him out? And I said, uh, well, maybe. I said, I think I have a strategy for it. He goes, what is it? I said, well, there's one or two ways that you can get him out. I said, why don't you give me a cell phone in prison and let me talk to him. I'll get him out. Where do you want him? Aruba? He's, they said, no, Aruba, no. Costa Rica. I said, got it. I'll put him up in Costa Rica for you. They said, uh, they're looking at each other. And they go, a cell phone for you in prison. I don't think they're going to pull that off. Do you have any other ideas? I said, I have one more idea. And this one is bulletproof. They said, what is it? I said, well, if you call the American embassy and you tell them to call this guy and tell him that his visa that he applied for years ago has just gotten granted because he was denied. But if you grant it, next day he'll be in a flight to Orlando to see Mickey. They said, he has to know that all these people have been talking about him for years. I mean, the only reason why we know that he exists is because there's other people that are talking about him. It just so happens that they talked about you too, but we didn't know who you were. They always talk about the money guy in the United States, but they didn't know who you were. So he's gotta know. I said, believe me, he doesn't know. If the embassy calls him, he'll be here the next day. They looked at each other. The prosecutor said, Washington will approve that. That's all I heard. That's all I knew. They sent me back to my cell. Months go by, nothing. I'm stuck in Miami. I'm calling my attorney. My attorney tells me, listen, it doesn't matter what you gave them. There is no extradition in Venezuela. So unless this guy flies into the United States, you're stuck with 15 years. That's it. Well, one day they call me down to go to the doctor. When they call me down to go to the doctor, I'm sitting there, and it just so happens that that same day, they're bringing the new inmates to go see medical. So I'm sitting there waiting, and they're bringing all these people from the streets with street clothing, and uh, they start calling names, their names. Whoever, 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 whoever. And all of a sudden they say, this guy's name. And I go, oh my God, that's the guy. And I look like this out of the side of my eye and I see they arrested him. The guy went to the embassy, got his visa. But as I see him, he's wearing a Disney shirt. And I'm like, oh my God, this guy is wearing a Disney shirt. They caught him landing in Orlando. So he walks in, he doesn't see me. I tell the guard, I don't wanna to go to the doctor anymore. You need to bring me to the unit. You need to bring me to the unit. He takes me up to the unit. I call my attorney and I said, listen, do you have news for me? He said, uh, no. I said, well, I have news for you. They just arrested this guy. He goes, I need you to hang up and call me back in an hour. I hang up. I call back in an hour. He said, pack your stuff. Tomorrow they're moving you back to Coleman. Sure enough, they caught they call the guy. You need to be separated. So they pack me up. They move me to Coleman. But the news now is are out. And apparently this guy showed up and he's walking out the plane with like the Mickey Mouse ears and the Mickey Mouse shirt and his, his whole family is like, I hope, I hope, I And as they're walking out of the plane, DEA agents are waiting for him going, hey, you're under arrest for extortion, drug trafficking, and money laundering. And boom, they arrest him right then and there. They send me to Orlando. And when I arrive into Orlando, I encounter for the first time the leader of the Colombian cartel whose money I lost. 
and I look at the guy and I get introduced and I say, I know who you are. You are Beto Marin. And he goes, you are the Venezuelan guy with the money? I say, yeah. Dude, you kidnapped me for three days. And he just starts laughing and he goes, no, 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 no. I didn't know it was you. I just wanted my money back. And I said, man, that's insane. We were in the same prison. And he goes, yeah, but you know, listen, no hard feelings. And I'm like, dude, you kidnapped me from three years, for, for three days, I mean. Why would you have hard feelings against me? He said, you lost my money. I said, well, I guess you have a point there. So for a while, I remember I would be walking around prison and I would tell my friends like, listen, I gotta go talk to my kidnapper, say what's up. And I will sit there and we'll trade stories and, and he'll tell me like, oh my God, I did this and I did that. And, and I, I remember this money ended up on your account and that money ended up on your account. And I was like, oh my God, I didn't know this. Like I seriously didn't know this was cartel money. One day he tells me, he's like, listen, when you went to Venezuela, remember how they used to give you a car to drive around? Yeah, he's like, that was my car. And I, I, all I kept thinking was, that is so screwed up. I mean, people could have thought that I was a drug trafficker. So days go by, weeks go by, months go by. This guy that gets arrested on the airport gets convicted. They drop most of the charges. He starts cooperating from the moment he gets arrested. He gets a six-year sentence, which is later reduced due to cooperation, to three years. He gets in, he gets out, he goes home, I'm still in prison. By this time, they had moved me from a low-custody prison to a penitentiary, to Thompson USP. And I'm sitting there going, what the hell is going on? Five years go by, six years go by, nothing. I'm thinking... I gotta do my time. That's it. The government screwed me. I call my attorney every now and then. He will say there's nothing we can do. If they don't want to give it to you, they don't have to give it to you. They don't have to reduce your sentence. Your prosecutor doesn't want to reduce your sentence. He's the one that is opposing. I mean, the prosecutors of this case, of the Venezuelan case, they love me. One of them was Adam Phelps, who ended up being the prosecutor from El Chapo. The other one was uh, Dick Gregory, who's the prosecutor for Manuel Noriega. And uh, they just love me. But my attorney kept telling me, as long as your prosecutor hates you, you're not getting a day of your sentence. So now I'm serving time in a penitentiary in Illinois. And uh, one day I get a phone call from my attorney and he goes, I need you to pack your stuff. You're coming down to Miami. You are getting resentenced. They fly me down to Miami, and uh, I go in front of the judge. My attorney goes, this is the first time this happens in federal court, where you're going to have three prosecutors in one hearing. I get, uh, my prosecutor, the prosecutors from the Venezuelan case get up, and they start talking. And they said, listen, he uncovered the biggest drug trafficking conspiracy in the Western Hemisphere. It's, uh, he was the key element because the money flew through his account. He's not in the drug business. He was a finance guy, but, uh, but his information was key. My prosecutor gets up and says, so you mean to tell me that not only he has, he's a fraudster, but on top of that, he launders money and we didn't know about it. And now we're gonna reward this guy. This guy should be doing 30 or 40 years. He shouldn't be doing 15 years, your honor. This guy is the poster child of a scum bucket. He's got to sit in prison, and I'm sitting there going, what the hell is going on here? My kids now are old, older. They're sitting there. They're looking at it. They're crying their eyes out. They're hearing all this stuff about his father, and this guy's a womanizer, and he used money to trick women, and, and I'm sitting there going, oh my God, this is horrendous. And then the judge looks at me, and says, do you know what? I need you to do two more years for me. Boom. So my sentence got reduced from 15 years to nine and a half years. And uh, I got transferred once again to another prison, this time to, a, to D. Ray James, which is a prison only for foreigners. 
and I show up there, I'm coming from a penitentiary, I've done time, and it's all, this, all these gang members are in this prison, and there's like MS-13, and Sureños, and Norteños, and Paisas, and all this stuff. And I'm sitting there going like, listen, I don't, I'm not gonna run with anybody. I don't care about anybody. I just gotta do my last two years, and I wanna go home. And uh, this didn't sit well with them, because you had to run with somebody. And you have to be a part of a gang, I guess. And I didn't want to be that. So, about 16 months into my final two years, I get, I'm told that I have to join a gang. I have to pick a gang. And I said, listen, I'm not going to pick any gang. I don't care about what anybody says. I just, that's not how I do it. I haven't done my time like that. I come from a pen. I'm not even in a penitentiary. I have to pick a gang. So I'm definitely not going to do it in this Mickey Mouse prison. So they get super upset. They go snitch on me. And they find out that I'm part of this huge Venezuelan case. And uh, they say, listen, this guy's a rat. And this guy doesn't want to join a gang. And we're going to kill him once he's here. And so they pick me up and they send me to solitary. And I spent six months in solitary confinement. Originally, it was going to be two months and they were going to transfer me out. But then COVID hit and all the transfers were stopped. So I ended up spending six months in solitary from January to June. On June 2nd, 2020, I finally get released from prison after serving eight years and one month. As I'm walking out of prison, there are two agents waiting for me and they say, you are now a free man. They handcuff me, they chain me again and they go, you are now under the custody of the Department of Homeland Security. We want to deport you. And they transfer me from a prison to a detention center for immigrants. And the last seven months I spent under the custody of ICE, fighting my immigration case. I get released in December 23rd at 8 o'clock at night, and I show up at my daughter's house. Nobody knew I was getting released. I didn't know I was getting released. The difference between prison and a detention center is, in a detention center, you don't have a release date. They'll just come one day and tell you, hey, you're going home. And that's what they did to me. They came and they said, listen, you're going home. And I showed up at my daughter's house. And my youngest daughter was there. And uh, I'm sure there is a clip there somewhere where you see the, the, the pain on my daughter's heart when they start crying. And my youngest daughter kept asking me, when are you going back to prison, daddy? When are you going back to prison? And I kept telling her, baby, I'm out. This is it. I'm done. This is it. And, uh, man, it was just amazing. It was just an amazing feeling. But you're so numbed. When you get out of prison, you're so numbed. The people expect you to cry and, and to hug you. But you're, the system breaks you to the point where you no longer are an optimistic person. The system breaks you to a point where you're always waiting for the other shoe to drop. And sure enough, it dropped a little bit here and there. I got out and I was not allowed to work. I, I couldn't get a driver license, so I didn't have an ID. I couldn't get credit, uh, but I had to pay a restitution. I owe the federal government $33.5 million, and every month I had to make payments on it, but I didn't have a job. I couldn't support myself. I couldn't live anywhere, so I had to live in a couch in a friend's house. Then I went to a bedroom on another friend's house. Uh, my kids had to support me until I started figuring out how to navigate the system and how to volunteer my time and get some of my expenses covered based on that time that I volunteer. But it really took me a year to get my driving privileges back and to get my, my uh, an ID and to get my work authorization back. And now we're looking at uh, December 2021. So it's really not until 2022 that I'm able to work and that I'm able to drive and that I'm able to, that I can exist, that I can open a bank account and have a debit card. 
and uh, and the future is now so bright but I know it's not a straight road and I think that's the difference I think the difference is people like me they know we know that our journey is full of obstacles self-imposed but it's full of obstacles and uh, to this point my mother who's ill doesn't know that I went to prison for eight and a half years I had to call her from prison and uh, she will yell at me and tell me that I was a bad son because I didn't call her for longer than five minutes at a time or that I will go weeks without calling her and how come I haven't visited her in eight years and I had to tell her that I was traveling, that I was working overseas. I mean, now I have to reestablish a relationship with my mother with an eight and a half year gap that she never know about, that she will never, she will never know the pain. I had to, I have to get to know my kids again. I left a 12 year old that when I got out was 21. I left a 21 that when I got out was 29. Uh, I miss my daughter's wedding, my daughter's graduations. I have had to learn that you don't make up for lost time. You just move on. And, uh, and that's what I'm doing, moving on. Moving on from all that, moving on from the past. I now do a lot of advocacy work, uh, justice reform, immigration law reform, uh, women's abuse, domestic violence. It's finding a way to redeem myself. But more important, to become an example for my kids. They've already seen we're doing the wrong thing. Let me too. Now I'm trying to show you we're doing the right thing can lead me to. And that's my story. <laughs>